here tonight. This is our ninth session of From Tin Pan Alley Cats to the Great White Way. And we are finishing up with my presentation on Jewish composers on Broadway with the more contemporary composers. Probably some names you've not heard of, but hopefully the shows you have. I don't have any theatrical history about this one, but we will be doing a little bit more of a deep dive on the shows themselves. So it's a little bit different tonight, not as many shows and more about the history of the shows and about the composers as well, since that's a little short as they are all still very much alive and composing. All right. So first up on the list, this is Stephen Litvak. Stephen Litvak was born in the Bronx, New York in 1959. He's done a wide variety of work as a singer, songwriter, composer, and musician, and sometimes also some stuff as comedian as well. Litvak made his Broadway debut with A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder, a show I'm sure some of you have heard of, which won Best Musical in 2014. Litvak is currently an assistant adjunct professor at the Tisch School in New York at NYU. Some of his other works include a musical about Hannah Senesh, it was off-Broadway, the Wayside Motor Inn and Almost September. So naturally, we're going to talk about A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder. So A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder, as previously mentioned, the music was by Stephen Litvak. The lyrics by Robert L. Friedman and Stephen Litvak. They worked together on this and the book as well. The original cast included uh, Jefferson Mays, Bryce Pinkham, Jane Carr, Lisa O'Hare, and Lauren Warsham. Some of the more popular songs from the show included I Decided to Marry You, Inside Out, Poison in My Pocket, and That Horrible Woman. Now, for those of you who have not seen the show, I believe it came to Denver a few years ago uh, on tour. It's about Monty Navarro, who is rather down on his luck, not very wealthy, not quite poor man. And he discovers that his mother was disinherited from the Dysquith family. And with that, he discovers that by that, even though she was disowned, he is in line to potentially inherit the dice with the title of Earl and all that goes with it. So the money, the land, all of that. However, there's a few people uh, that are in the way of the title. And he's given the idea that maybe there's a way that he can speed things up a little bit by very cleverly and rather cartoonishly killing off each and every one of them in rather absurd ways until he does exactly get what he need, what he wants at the end. Which sounds a lot more grim and dark than it actually is if you've not seen it. Now the song that we're showing is called Foolish to Think and this is partly where Mar Monty makes up his mind on what he's going to do. Thanks. 
So if anybody's wondering why Monty's mother was disinherited, it's because she did not live up to family standards and ended up marrying a Castilian man, which instantly made her a lot less desirable in English society. This is, I believe, 1909 is when this is set. Now, keep in mind that specifically it was Castilian in Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder. Okay, my... Now, this is not the only version of this story. A film adaptation in 1949 starred which famous actor? I'm going to throw up the poll here. There we go. We've got Laurence Olivier, Peter O'Toole, Alec Guinness, or Cary Grant. Surely someone's going to take a guess. <laughs> Okay, six out of 22. I think we can do a lot better than this. Okay, nine out of 23. Nothing bad happens if you get it wrong. This is more just for fun than anything. <laughs> okay, we'll give it a little bit longer. Got well, just a little bit about half Anybody else want to take a stab at it? A little bit more? Okay. All right. So, the general consensus <laughs> was that it stars Cary Grant. Let's go take a look. Indeed, this was a very young Alec Guinness. Who's the Duke? There was my employer, Lord Escoyne Descoyne. There was Admiral Lord Horatio Descoyne. There was General Lord Rufus Descoyne. There was Lady Agatha Descoyne. And in the pulpit, talking interminable nonsense, the Reverend Lord Henry Descoyne. The life cut short was one rich in achievement and promise of service to humanity. The Descoyne certainly appeared to have accorded with the tradition of the landed gentry and sent the fool of the family into the church. So if any of you, if you, any of you were very eagle-eyed in noticing that not only did it star Alec Guinness, that he played multiple roles, namely that he played the entire Descoyne family, which has since followed on in tradition of Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder, where one person, and in the case of the original Broadway cast, it was Jefferson Mays, plays the entire Dicewith family. The original idea was Alec Guinness's idea. He thought it would be a lot of fun. And clearly, as you can tell, had a lot of fun with it. So the source material, before the play, before the movie, we have a book that was written by Roy Horman, and it was originally published in 1907. It was called Israel Rank, the Autobiography of a Criminal. And at the time, Horniman was considered a contemporary of Oscar Wilde, as mentioned. So the name of the film is called Kind Hearts and Coronets and was inspired by this book. It tells the story of a man who was the son of a Jewish commercial traveler who is sitting in his cell writing his memoirs after murdering six people to earn himself the title of an earldom. The novel features many anti-Semitic attitudes that were common in Victorian England at the time. So with early changes that were seen no, hang on, that were seen early on with the 1949 film they changed it from being jewish they changed it originally it was italian was that the part that made i don't think his name was multi i think it was lewis in kind hearts and coronets was why he was disinherited and in gentleman's guide to love and murder was castilian and according to stephen litvak he didn't do that to avoid anti-Semitism. He and according to him and Robert Freeman, they chose Castilians just because they thought it was funnier. And in a way, as previously mentioned with Oliver, they are reclaiming anti-Semitic tropes and using it for good or, you know, reclaiming those ideas and taking the story that was pretty disparaging of Jews and turning it into something a lot more fun and a lot more, I guess, open to everybody would be the way to describe it. It was a lot, it spoke to the masses a bit more when Monty is not specifically Jewish or anything else like that. This is my favorite song from um, Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder. Monty finds himself in quite a predicament between Phoebe and Sabella. 
both women he's very interested in <laughs> in different ways and for different reasons. And both are in the same room at the same at the same flat at the same time, leading to some very awkward results. This is from the Tony Award performance. I decided to marry you. I decided to marry you. I decided though Henry's gone, that life goes on for me. I have thoroughly thought it through. And the man that I want is you. Though it's true that I'm quite a few who strongly disagree. Nonetheless, I will marry you. I confess that I'm frightened too. But unless I am wrong, you long for love as much as I. This is quite a conventional, I admit. But why should that matter a whit? And if you do not say yes at once, I think I'll die. Miss Dicewith, you've rendered me speechless. Yes. May I call you Phoebe? Yes. What am I doing here? This could be dangerous if I'm discovered. Imagine the scandal, and I couldn't handle a scandal so visible. I'll stay invisible, still as can be. But what's going on in there? I can hear voices I recognize. Bondi, but is that a woman? And if that's a woman, then what is she doing here? Is that the cousin I wish I could see? If it's that cousin, it might just be business. It's family business, and none of my business. But why is she here in the home of a bachelor? Of course, one could point out that I'm here as well, but does she not realize this situation puts her reputation severely in question? The mere suggestion could cause a sensation, and I cannot hear which is hell. I, to marry I you. could go home. Oh, you, my I should go. Still, I've decided to live my life and be a wife again. Who believe on my life as I should be on? After craving my queen, he makes me laugh. There is nothing can then long in like half a steel man. And there's goodness to spare in you. Isn't this fun? And the gentleness there in you. Isn't she done? You've taken a wounded bird and taught her how to fly. Oh, this is a This is quite unconventional. Is it not? Or rather a turn in the plot. And so will I be your fiancé. Oh, why don't you send the cow away? Hey, darling, when I, I go this day, day, I think I'll cry. Go! What was that? What was what? What sound? Is there someone here? Oh, pay no attention. That's my new manservant. He's just finding his way around. I'll be with you in a moment! Wordsworth! Isn't this madness? Who could foresee how one trick of timing could ruin it all? One in the parlor, one in the bedroom, nothing between them but me and a wall. Look at me, be noble and pious, my esteem for only grows. But when I am with Phoebe, I am on fire, thinking of Sibella, full of desire, passion, and dare I say it, love. But when I'm with Sibella, whom do I admire? None but Phoebe, perfect and lovely, who couldn't love her, heaven knows. Round and round and round it goes. How happy I'd be to be at your disposal. My darling, of course, I accept your proposal. Now is the kiss. That would be bliss. But darling, but first I'll say this. I've decided to marry you. Be, 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 I decided be, to marry you. What I hate to you. I've been forward for and set me free. And there's a bell. Oh, oh, yes, I'd be honored to marry you. Want you? Want you? Be, you could have done to me. So to answer some questions I saw pop up in the chat, as far as I know, Castilians are not offended. Uh, the way it's done in the show, it's not particularly disparaging. As you can see that both uh, Phoebe and Sabella think that that's very attractive. <laughs> uh, and then we also have some further, yes. Um, ironically, yes, Sabella is actually married to somebody else. Thank you, Sherry, that is very true. And is in sense that Phoebe, and yeah, and also Phoebe is Monty's cousin as well, but you know, weirder things happen in costume dramas. <laughs> All right, moving on to our next composer. This is Irene Sankoff. She was born in North York, Ontario, Canada. Don't know, I don't remember if I have had any other Canadians. I'll have to double check. Sankoff attended York University in North York, Ontario. This is also where she met her husband and writing partner, David Hine. Sankoff double majored in psychology and creative writing during her time at school. And that's when they first began to co-write together. The two of them moved to New York City following graduation in 1999. 
And one of the things that first got them really noticed was she wrote a play based on a song that Hein had written called My Mother's Lesbian Jewish Wiccan Wedding, which was based on his own personal experience with his mother and his uh, and her um, new partner. And that was actually what led to their probably their most famous work to date, which I'm sure you'll all be familiar with. It's got a lot of attention recently. Welcome to the land where the winter strike to kill us and we said, we will not be killed. Welcome to the land where the water strike to drown us and we said, we will not be drowned. Welcome to the land where we lost our loved ones and we said, we will still go. I drop my kids off at school and head to the SPCA where I'm greeted by my other kids all barking and meowing for breakfast in a belly rub not that I'm complaining I love some but by the time feeding is done I got to get back to pick up my human kids so I take just one second for myself and I'm sitting in my car I'm in the staff room I'm in the library and, and I, I turn, turn on the radio, radio. I'm running my radar when Bonnie comes by. She pulls off and she's waving at me like that. So I roll down my window and she says, Oz, turn on the radio. Slow it down, Bonnie. Oz, turn on your radio. You are here at the start of the day. You song is called Welcome to the Rock and it's from Come From Away, which as mentioned has gotten a lot of attention recently as it was the pro shot was put out on Apple TV and because of the uh, 20th anniversary of the September 11 attacks. So going off of that, how many planes were diverted from to Gander, Newfoundland? That whole thing. Got 27, 29, 32 or 38. Got some one very sure person. <laughs> okay, we've got 10, 11. People seem to be a little less afraid to answer my polls these days. This is exciting. Okay, got 11. Maybe get a few more. Yeah, all right. Well, the general consensus is 38, and that would be correct. Picture here is actually from the um, runways at Gander International Airport from the day that that happened. And as you can see, that's kind of crazy looking. All right, so come from away. Music, book, and lyrics by Irene Sankoff and David Hine. Original cast included Katrina Bromley, Jen Colella, Joel Hatch, Rodney Hicks, Q Smith, Sharon Wheatley, and Lee McDougall. Some of the songs include Welcome to the Rock, Me in the Sky, Prayer, and I Am Here. Now, Come From Away is pretty interesting. So, following the attacks when the, air, the, entire, when the United States airspace was closed, many planes were diverted all across Canada and part of what was called Operation Yellow Ribbon. And as the um, composers would like to say, this is not a September 11th story. This is a September 12th story. This is more about what happened afterwards, since they were there for a total of five days afterwards. It was also very much a labor of love. They went to Gander, Newfoundland during that 10-year um, anniversary when, as they said, the plane people came back. 
and they spoke to people and got their stories and worked at this for about four years to compile what became Come From Away, which in itself has a very interesting structure. It never stops moving. There is no intermission. It goes straight through. It's about, I think, an hour and 45 minutes is what it tops out at, which is fairly short for your standard musical if you really think about it, even if it may not sound like it. And because of that, you kind of really feel the tension and kind of the pressure that's building up of like, you know, not knowing what's going on or what's happening when. And it's also very much that the entire cast basically stays on stage the entire time and that the band is there with them, which is another interesting choice. What's most interesting is, is that basically every single song in the show is an ensemble number in some way. There's nobody who really gets a solo with the exception of really Jen Colella. And we'll talk about that in a bit. <laughs> So the source material, it's Come From Away, is based on Operation Yellow Ribbon, and it was the Canadian response to the United States shutting down their airspace following the 9-11 attacks. Flights were redirected to various provinces, including Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, British Columbia, Alberta, and Manitoba. In total, there were approximately 225 to 240 planes, and they were redirected to about 17 different airports. Here's our next song from Come From Away. This is called prayer, the prayer. And I like this song in particular because as you will know, if if you have not seen this before, if you listen closely, there's a prayer you might actually know. You don't want me to check on you. The library's open for anyone looking for some peace and a quiet place to pray. <laughs> Despair in life, let me bring hope. And where there's darkness, only light. And where there's sadness, ever joy. Now, this also actually was based on someone else's experience. Uh, and his name's Kevin. And he spoke about this, although he forgot that he actually spoken to Irene and David about this that at one point during his stay in Gander, he had um, his hymn running through his head. And he was so shocked when he saw them do this in the show, because as previously mentioned, he'd forgotten that he'd even told them. And he's like, how did you know? So this seems like a very odd thing to talk about next. This is called the ugly stick. And this is a traditional Newfoundland instrument or, well, I guess you could call it that. I'm honestly not sure what to call it. They can explain it far better than I can. And I will admit, I had a hard time understanding them, so I've thrown on closed captions because that is a very thick Newfoundland accent, and I was struggling. Well, this funny looking thing here is called, uh, well, we call it the ugly stick. <laughs> First time I saw an ugly stick, I went to a, to a house party one night, and uh, one of my buddies was playing the squeeze box, and, uh, and a guy by the name of Sir Abbott bought out this stick and started beating on it, and he was good at it. And I said, what's that thing you got there? And I tell you, most people figure it's something for scaring the bears away. When they're walking, <laughs> you can tap it on the ground and it keeps the bears away. I get them all going, right? That's good. That's oh, good yeah, one. yeah. You're keeping the bears away. Well, I say, well, we work for that, too, so... <laughs> The ugly stick is still evolving, I guess, uh, and, and, and the jury is out. It could be getting uglier, and it could be getting prettier. Pretty, uh, it depends. We'll see in 50 years where, where it goes. Yeah, that, yeah. So it could be the pretty stick in 50 years' time. We don't we'll know. Wait and see. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The pretty ugly stick. The pretty ugly stick. So it is something that you can 100% make on your own if you so choose. Essentially, it's either a stick or, in this case, more often than not, it's a mop. 
and you attach uh, washers, you attach beer bottle caps and all sorts of things to it to make a percussive instrument. And we're talking about this because this is actually featured in Come From Away along with some other Newfoundland traditions. They mention foods like tautens, which are an interesting little biscuit sort of thing. I'm not sure how to describe it. I've had them now, but it's an odd little thing. It's interesting. As well as the music, which is, you know, we're here to talk about composers and stuff. So Newfoundland music and their culture was very heavily inspired and used throughout Come From Away. Namely, sea shanties. So sea shanties are traceable to approximately the 1400s. Now the shanty is really simply a working song that ensured that the sailors involved in heavy manual tasks such as ramping around the capstan or hoisting the sails for a departure were synchronized in their individual efforts to keep to execute the collective task. Okay. For an example, simply making sure that each sailor pushed or pulled at precisely the same time. The key was making sure that this happened was rhythm. Now, a shanty man was usually somebody who would be leading the song while the crew would follow either at the choruses or the verses. But the term shanties, calling them sea shanties, only dates back to approximately the 1800s, with like one of the first published references being in the 1860s. So these are two songs that may not sound like they're two different songs, um, but they are two Newfoundland sea shanties. One's called, um, one of them's called Heave Away, and he, like, Heave Away My Jollies and Heave Away Me Johnny. It's, it's a little confusing, but they are different enough. And I'm showing you these because both of these songs were mashed together into one to create a new sea shanty that was actually featured in Come From Away, which we'll look at in a minute. So here's the first one. This is Hib Hib Away Me Jollies. Get your duds in order, cause we're bound across the water. Heave away, me jollies, heave away. Come get your duds in order, cause we're bound to leave tomorrow. Heave away, me jolly boys, we're all bound away. Sometimes we're bound for Liverpool, sometimes we're bound for Spain. Heave away, me jollies, heave away. But now we're bound for old St. John's where all the girls are dancing. Heave away, let me jolly boys, we're all bound away. I wrote me love a letter, I was on the Jenny Lynn. Heave away, me jollies, heave away. I wrote me love a letter and I signed it with a ring. Heave away, let me jolly boys, we're all bound away. The next one is Heave Away Me Johnny, which Sounds similar, but it is not quite the same. There is some that's bound for New York down, and some that's bound for France. Heave away, me Johnny. Heave away. And there's some that's bound for the Bengal Bay to teach them whales a dance. Heave away, me Johnny boy. We're all bound to go. Our pilot is waiting for the turning of the tide. Heave away, me Johnny. Heave away. And then me girls will be gone again with the good and westerly wind. Heave away, me Johnny boys. We're all bound to so those two became this. Farewell to all you pretty ladies waving from the dock. Heave away, me jollies, heave away. Now, next is a song, as mentioned before, Come From Away really is an ensemble piece. Everybody's basically on stage the entire time. They play multiple roles and really nobody gets a true solo in the way you would normally see in musicals. 
with the exception of Jen Colella, even if there are others backing her up at this point. Now, what's happening here, I'm gonna give you context because I have to, unfortunately, she only show the clips from this song. She plays a character by the name of Beverly Bass, who is a pilot. Well, I don't think she's a pilot anymore, but he was the first American, like female American pilot, like a commercial airline pilot. And she was one of the pilots who was diverted to Gander. And the song itself really tells her whole story about how she got there. And it's quite amazing. And I'm always very shocked when I hear it to be like, how have I never heard of her? This is very frustrating to me. But it's a beautiful song. It's a really inspiring story. And I very much encourage all of you to listen to the whole thing if you've never heard it before. shouldn't be in the cockpit hey lady hey baby hey why don't you grab us a drink and the flight attendants weren't my friends back then and they said are you better than us do you So also looking into Beverly Bass herself is very, very fascinating. She's since Come From Away has come out, she's put out a lot of videos talking about her experience um, as being a pilot. Moving on, this is David Yazbek. David Yazbek was born in New York City in 1961, and he studied cello and piano during his school years. For college, he attended Brown University, and he took part in a student-run theater group before graduating in 1982. Asbeck has released a number of albums and composed a number of popular children's TV themes, including Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego? He had uh, his Broadway debut with a musical adaptation of The Full Monty. His other works include Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, The Band's Visit, and Tootsie. Tonight, though, specifically we'll be talking about The Band's Visit. Our next poll. Who originated the role of Tufik on Broadway? We've got Sasan Gabe, we've got Tony Shalhoub, Brian Darcy James, or Santino Fontana. <laughs> okay, we've got four out of 22. Okay, we've got a few more. Getting a decent spread in my answers here. Got nine out of 22. Anybody else? 
Anybody? Anybody? Huh? No? Just nine? <laughs> Guess that might have to do. All right. And the general consensus is Tony Shalhoub. And you would be correct. Yes, of Monk and Mrs. Maisel fame. Tony Shalhoub originated the role of Tufik on Broadway. So fans visit. Came out in 2017. Music and lyrics by David Yazbek. Book by Itamar Moses. The original cast included Katrina Lenk, Tony Shalhoub, Yatai Benson, Adam Cantor, and Ariel Stiefel. Songs include Omar Sharif, Welcome to Nowhere, Poppy Here's the Ocean, and Answer Me. It is based on an Israeli film of the same name, although in Hebrew. And it's the story of the, I believe it's the Alexandra Ceremonial Police Band coming to Israel to perform a concert. However, they end up in very much the wrong city and there's no buses till morning. And it's because of a communication error where in Arabic certain letters don't exactly exist. And so that's how they make their error. But I don't want to give that away because that's part of my next trivia question. <laughs> I'll talk in a moment. So where was the, the band supposed to go? Petak Tikva, Chovot, Herzliya, or Yerucham? I've got two people who are very, very sure on this one. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. A few more answers. Okay, only nine people again. Surely we can break it to ten. Maybe. Yep. Okay. So most of you think that the answer is and you would be correct. So the error is that apparently B and P have very similar or basically the same sound. So instead of ending up in Petatikva, they end up in this town in the desert called Betatikva, where there is no buses until morning. So the town kind of sort of takes them in for the night. That's an interesting story. I will say the film is a little odd, but it's certainly worth a watch. This is a song called Welcome to Nowhere, where Dina, who owns a cafe, kind of explains a little bit what, what town is like and that it is definitely not Petak Tikva. <laughs> There was once only deserts in the town of Bet Adikva. See apartments. Gaze upon my cafe. While you're here, be sure to go back and forth between my cafe and the apartments. So much to explore. Sand hill of your choosing. Take some bricks that no one's using. Build some buildings, put some Jews in. Then blah blah blah. Let us keep up. Here we go. I'll say between this song and my and originally seeing only a very brief trailer of this, my general consensus was when this was first coming out, I was like, wow, someone really knows what Israel's like and really knows how Israelis act and didn't had no other context at that point in time. So the source material is the film. It's a comedy drama and it was originally released in 2007. It was an international co-production between Israel, France and the United States. And it was submitted for foreign film for the Academy Awards. However, it was rejected because the dialogue was more than 50% in English. Doesn't mean it didn't win any awards, though. It won eight Ophir Awards, including Best Film. And Ophir Awards are basically the Israeli equivalent of an Oscar. Cast included Ronit Alkabetz, Sasson Gabi, Ori Gabriel, and Saleh Bakri. I'll go back to that. 
Well, this is from the Tony performance of uh, the band's visit, and it's a song called Omar Sharif. Where Dina with Tufik kind of talks about her childhood and how when she was growing up, she would listen to the songs of Um Kultum and watch videos, of, uh, start watch movies with um, Omar Sharif and how much she loved them and how that's kind of her familiarity with Egyptian culture. The best movie was The River of Love where they meet on the train and she is reading and he says... Uh, a book as a loyal companion always. You know it. Oh, yes. Friday evening over Shari in black and white and blurry through tears my mother and i would sit there in a trance he was cool to the mayor of the fair of romance sunday morning her voice would fill our A special performance by Bruce Springsteen is and that was Omar Sharif from the band's visit. So why am I talking about Sasan Gavi? I'm sure as you saw, he was in the cast of the original film, The Band's Visit. We'll get to that. Gavi was born in Baghdad, Iraq, to a Sephardic family, and when he was a young child, his family immigrated to Israel. Following his army service, he studied theater and psychology at Tel Aviv University. He started doing a lot of theater work, including at the Hakamre Theater, the Be'er Sheva Theater, and the Beit Lesson Theater. Some of his plays included Catch-22, Servant of Two Masters, uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and including in 1989, he also played the role of Captain Hook in Peter Pan. In 2007, he starred in the film, The Band's Visit, and then he went on to reprise the role of Tufik in the musical adaptation uh, on Broadway, and as well as he did part of the national tour before it would shut everything down. Which, you know, pretty unheard of for somebody who originated the role in the film to go and do it in the musical, and more often than not, People who are in films are not necessarily the greatest singers. And here we are. And I think that's pretty fascinating. And actually, that is where we end tonight. <laughs> uh, except for one last poll, of course, as always. How many of these shows have you seen? One or two, all of them, or none yet. <laughs> okay. Okay, I've got some people who are not very familiar with some of these shows. Yes, I hope that I've inspired you to go and check some of them out. Lots of local groups do Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder as well these days since the rights are available. Uh, we've got Boy Band Visit, Visit is coming back soon. 
and come from away. As mentioned, you can see a per shot on Apple TV if you happen to know somebody who's got it or if you've got it yourself, I highly recommend viewing that. All right, well, thank you everyone for attending tonight. I believe we are off for the next two months, so no session in December, no session in January. I will be back with more information, including potentially some looks at the more biblical shows that have been on Broadway, as well as one, some actors you probably did not actually know were Jewish. All right. Well, let me just double check and make sure I did not have any chats that I missed. Doesn't look like it. Are there any, uh, any questions anybody's got about any of this? No? Yeah? No? Yeah? All right. Well, once again, thank you to everyone who's attended. I'm very glad that you have enjoyed this and have been introduced to some new musicals tonight. Have a good evening.